Our text today is read from the first letter of St. Peter the Apostle to the Church, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now, for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We have talked about the divine sovereignty and the election of God, and the great calling and blessing and provision that God has made for his people in giving us the gift of sanctification, in electing us not only to justification, but to sanctification and obedience, in giving us a new life, a new birth, a new hope, in giving us a rich and meaningful inheritance that cannot be corrupted or defiled, and keeping, for, keeping that for us in heaven against that day, and also keeping us against that day, who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed 
in the last time, and that calls particular attention to the fact that there's coming a day when all of this operation of God is finally going to be revealed in the sense that it will be complete. It will all be put out in the open, everything God has been doing. It will be something that we will then share in intellectually and understand, and it will be the justification of all that has gone on in the program of God and in our lives. Now St. Peter says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. The thing that distinguishes true Christian thought from humanism, whether that humanism is secular or religious, is that all of humanism, with its religion, with its positive thinking, with its scientific goals and ambitions, and all of the other things, the philosophies, the psychologies that go along with it, humanism has all of its values in this world and in this life. It follows the philosophy of the blasphemous philosopher Voltaire. Everything for the best, said Voltaire in this best of all possible worlds. Christian philosophy says everything is for the best now only in light of the fact that this is not the best of all possible worlds. There is a better world to come, and everything is only for the best now for the child of God in light of that which is to come. Sometimes in the counterfeit religious thought that calls itself Christian, we hear it said, well, serving Jesus Christ is the happiest and the best and the most fulfilling and the most honorable and the most admirable and the most healthy and profitable life. Even if there was no God and no heaven and no future, it'd still be the way to live. St. Paul said that just is plainly not the case. That is absolutely, unequivocally not true. St. Paul the Apostle said in the 15th chapter of the 1st Corinthian letter that if all the hope we had was in this world, we followers of Jesus Christ would be the most miserable of all men. If this is all we had, we'd be the most wretched and to be pitied people on earth. Why is that? Because we're giving away now what the natural mind the unenlightened man considers to be of value in the belief that in order, in exchange for sacrificing this for the will of God and the kingdom of God, we will get something better. There is a dichotomy of thinking between Christian thought and all other thought, and I want to emphasize it doesn't make any difference if that thought is religious. One of the great misconceptions of history is that there is, from the biblical point of view, something inherently good about religion. The Bible is probably the hardest book on religion of anything that was ever written. There is more religious hypocrisy exposed and condemned in the Bible than any other writing, any other single volume. God is not looking for religion. I know that there's a religion that is pure and undefiled, and we think not to condemn all forms of religion, but the fact is that what God is looking for is truth and righteousness and obedience. Christian thought has nothing in common with humanism, even though it may be religious humanism. And the point of departure is this, that true Christian thought views this life in light of that which is to come, and because of that encourages the followers of Jesus Christ to take heart in the present trials and discomforts and inconveniences, knowing that this is good for us, it hardens us, it purifies us, and it bodes well for the future. It promises something good down the line. Now, if you stop within the realms of this life and the hedonistic 
self-indulgent mentality of the Western thought, you can get the same kind of thinking, but you have to condense it into this life. You put up with something difficult now for something good later on. And everybody who's ever been in the services likes to tell tales about how difficult the, the boot camp or the basic training was. We hear stories told about the old timers, the Battle of the Bulge and the Marne and so on. The glory that came in giving oneself for a great cause through the difficulties. The more difficult, the better. The great struggles that go on in a sporting event and the winning team brags about how hard that game was and how difficult it was and what a tough fought thing it was. The commentary of good literature, going back to the times of the classics and get away from this trashy dime store novel mentality of modern man, but the great classics of literature all have to do with tragedy, sacrifice, some brave young man riding into battle with his lady's colors wrapped around his steel glove or something. This is a mentality which natural man understands, but he wants to get the trouble over with and get the reward for the difficulties in the here and the now. The Christian, however, realizes that when the covenant was changed, God gave up on the program of reforming this world, of bringing a physical, literal, actual kingdom to pass in this world. You say that's not going to happen. Oh, no, my friend. And indeed, it is not. This sin-cursed earth is no fit place for the righteous God and his eternally righteous kingdom only, said St. Peter, and we will observe it here in a few verses in that new heavens and new earth wherein righteousness dwells. A change from looking for one's expression, one's reward, one's achievement, one's sense of values in terms of realizing their purpose and their good in this life to looking for them in the day of the resurrection and the world which is to come. You see, the Christian views this life the same way a student views school. I've got to go through it so I can get the qualification, so I can get out of it, so I can get on to the goal. And it is tolerable, all of the late nights of study and all of the other arduous things that I go through with are tolerable in light of the reward. The children of God push that day of reward on past these mortal years till the time of the coming of Christ and the reward of the saints and view their lives in light of that and in light of the fact that a great inheritance is laid up for us and reserved for us and is kept by God for us even as we ourselves are kept by God. The person who understands then rejoices in the knowledge that we are moving toward that day, toward that great day of judgment, the opening of the books and the rewarding of every man according to his works, and rejoices in the realization that he himself is involved in the achievement. He is a participant in Christ, his struggles, his sacrifices, his sufferings are redemptive and they are meaningful. They are the means by which the curse that we will suffer in this world is turned into something good and profitable. Nihilism sees man as having no purpose, no reason, no cause, no plan from a divine being from the perspective of history. Existentialism considers man to be an accident and his world to be an accident and gives man not only the right but the challenge to fight against all hostile forces with whatever means are available to him simply because he's a struggling part of evolutionary procedure. This is not the biblical way at all. In the biblical thought, there is design. 
There is purpose. There is reason. There is meaning. There is cause to suffer. Reason to participate. Something redemptive in the trials. And so the apostle said, you rejoice in this hope, even though now for a while it, it may be necessary because of the many trials that you will go through in life to be in heaviness. Still you rejoice. And this brings me to a point which I think I need to say something about, and that is the concept of joy. Now we're not particularly surprised that the humanist the non-Christian mind, the person who does not know God and the blessed hope, would view joy and its possession differently than we view it. That doesn't particularly surprise us. What is disappointing, unacceptable, and worthy of condemnation is the false concepts of joy that are being promoted in pseudo-Christian religion in the world today. Laugh and smile. We Christians are supposed to be happy. Go around with a light air and a giddy look on your face and a leering grin and always be upbeat. Think positively. What a damnable and corrupt falsehood this is. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but I want to remind you of something, just give you some food for thought. In all of the Bible, now I'm talking about the King James Bible and other legitimate translations. I'm not talking about these, this flurry of modern spurious things that are called Bibles that are actually people's own interpretations. But in the Bible, in the original Greek languages, in the legitimate, legitimate translations, the word smile, now listen to this, the word smile is never used in all the Bible. Never one time. In all the writing of the Bible, not only is it never given a commandment that man should smile, but the word isn't even in the biblical vocabulary. And in all of the New Testament, now hear me out, in all of the New Testament, including the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, only once, only once I tell you, is the word laugh used only once, and then it's used negatively. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn. If smiling and laughing are so important to godliness and to holiness and to Christian joy, then the Holy Spirit is guilty of a great oversight, because for all of the press and the uh, vexing pressures that are put on Christians today by those who misunderstand Christian joy and want to see us laugh and smile and carry on, the Holy Spirit never commanded it one time or said anything whatsoever about it. You say, well, maybe the Holy Spirit just wasn't interested in that kind of an issue. Maybe he just never thought to talk about one's mood and one's manner with respect to the gravity of life and how you view it. Well, if that is true, then answer me this question. Why, why did this same Holy Spirit who never pinned the word right and uh, smile in all the Bible and only one time laugh negatively used in the New Testament, why did that same Holy Ghost command the Christian church in more than 50 instances in the New Testament to be grave, to be sober, to be serious, to gird up the loins of their mind. Why? Why is the Holy Spirit so concerned that we be grave and sober and serious about life? And why are the modern religionists so concerned that we don't be grave and sober and serious about life? and so interested and so insistent that we go around putting on the face of a clown and a cheap stand-up comedy routine. Why is that? And the reason is simple, that these voices are the voices of the unenlightened who know nothing about Christian joy. Let me tell you something about Christian joy. 
Let me give you the supreme example of Christian joy. It says in the Bible of Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And yet the Bible tells us that Jesus wrestled in the garden with great internal restings and strugglings which were so enormous that he sweat blood out through the pores of his skin. And he said, Father, everything is possible to you. You can do all things. Don't make me go through this. I don't want to go through this. If there's any other way, I don't like this business. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. But Father, can you think of another way we can do it, maybe? And what was his mood? If you read in the fifth chapter of the book of Hebrews, you will hear these words said of Jesus Christ, with strong crying and tears, he prayed unto him who was able to save him from death. And even though he was a son, yet he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. He prayed to him with strong crying and tears and was heard in the thing that he feared. Jesus Christ didn't feel much like laughing, my friend, in the garden. And he didn't feel much like smiling. And there's no indication that Jesus had a smile on his face while he was carrying his cross up to Calvary's mountain. But there is in every indication, there is more than indication, there is direct and specific teaching and instruction in the Bible that he was filled with joy. Filled with joy. Wherein you greatly rejoice, even though now, if necessary, for a while you are in much heaviness through many temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious, much more precious than of the gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, even though these fires get hot, even though these trials and burdens get heavy and hard to bear, and our mood is one of much heaviness. It is the devil's lie, my friend, that would tell you that if you are going through trying times and you are in a heavy spirit, that there is no joy in your heart because of your Christian faith. The precedent of the Bible, listen to this, is to the contrary. If you're going through trials because of your faith and you are serious about life and you realize what's going on around you and you feel heavy about it, you probably are rejoicing in the Lord much more than these other Nicolaitan types who know nothing either about Christian joy or about suffering for the sake of Christ. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of the gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You remember the story of Job? One day Satan was in line with the sons of God, and this was before he was kicked out of heaven at the time of the resurrection. And he appeared before God, and God said, Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, Oh, yeah, sure, I've considered Job. What are you going to tell me? What a good Christian he is? Who wouldn't be a good Christian? He's rich, he's wealthy, he's famous, he's got a beautiful family. People come from all over to sit at his gate and hear his wisdom. He's got everything in the world. Job's got a lot of reason to trust in you. And God said, Yeah, well, Job's got all those things all right, but that's not why he trusts in me. And Satan said, yeah, well, talk is cheap, but you take those things away from him and see what happens. You see how quick he turns against you. You see how quick he curses you. And God said, it'll never happen, Satan. 
And Satan said, well, just let me try and let's see. And God permitted it. And the whole story of Job was for one reason and one only, and that was to show what Job himself confessed, even though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The faith of Job was put to the severest of tests, and it was proven. Job didn't trust God because he was healthy or because he had a good job or a good business or a good family or because he was liked in the community. Job trusted God because he trusted God. And that great example has helped millions of Christian people through the years, and Job will get a much greater reward in the day of Christ than if he lived an easy life on an easy street and died in luxury with no trials, and you and I would never have known anything about Job, the great wise man of the East. You see what God's doing with our lives? The trying of our faith is much more precious than the gold that perishes. Why? Because now we're talking about eternal things, things of infinite value that can never be taken from us. We're being put to the test. What are you going to do now that things aren't going your way? That's going to prove what kind of faith you've got in Jesus Christ and his kingdom, and it's going to say something much more effectively to the world around you than any clever words that you could think to put into a sermon. Rejoice. Pay no attention to the trials. However hard they get, take them righteously. Have the right attitude about them. Look to the day of Christ so that your faith might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And for the faithful, because of the power of God and the working of the Holy, Sco Holy Ghost in our lives, that's the way it is. Say. It is. Say. It is. Say. It is.